Thank you, everybody, for uh, heading out in the cold and miserable weather. Um, thanks for making the effort to, to still get here tonight. Um, great to see some new faces as well. So uh, for those of you who I haven't said hello to, I'm Jack, um, and uh, I work for Microsoft, um, and I'm also one of the co-founders of the Sussex Shore User Group. And yes, I sound a bit muffled because I've got the tail end of a cold. So um, yeah, I'll take a step back. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> um, and Ryan, do you want to do a quick intro? Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Ryan, also work for Microsoft. Um, in the Azure space, uh, yeah, we've uh, Jack and I have been doing this for over four years now, this user group. So uh, it's really good to see new faces. Um, we're trying to, uh, yeah, kind of grow the group and uh, sp spread the love on the Azure side, really. So, yeah, we're good. Indeed. So uh, as we just mentioned, we both work for Microsoft, but everything we say we cannot be held accountable for. <laughs> Nothing we say about Microsoft. <laughs> Uh, well, we, we had a guess, and that also goes for our speakers, right? So it's a very open, safe space. You're welcome to, to, to talk and talk down about products and say that's rubbish or this doesn't work, or even say that's amazing. And I love that. Like both both sides are great. Um, but yeah, yeah, just this is a safe it's, space. Yeah, definitely a safe space, but no warranty support. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, diversity charter. So we welcome everyone to this group, regardless of age, color, ethnicity, everything else. Everybody is welcome. Um, if you feel that that's not being upheld in any way, please let us know. Uh, it's super high on our priority list, this is. Yeah, absolutely. Very high on our list. Uh, tonight, we have the amazing John Craddock, uh, who is going to give us an amazing talk on uh, Entra SSE, highly requested from a few of our members. Um, so uh, are we finally saying goodbye to VPNs? Um, I, I hope so, but we'll see. Um, and then we're obviously, we're here until uh, we've finished networking and, and all had enough. So you're welcome to stick around, finish off what's left of the drinks and the food, and uh, we can all head uh, out and back home. And hopefully it's not raining by then. Um, a quick thank you to our amazing hosts, Runway East. Uh, so this is a co-working space. They're trying to like really shake up um, that what what co-working means in in the UK. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be the boring office that you normally used to. As you can see, this is pretty trendy and pretty hip. Um, you can have anything from a desk uh, for for yourself, or you know, a couple of hundred people offices. Like it's all flexible spaces here, um, and they provide this absolutely free for us to host these amazing events. So, um, big thank you to the team at Runway East, uh, and it's sort of become our our new home. Like this is maybe yes. like number four or five I think here. So yeah, I think four in a row here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a big thank you to the team always. And if you're looking for anything. Um, in terms of hot desking or maybe a new like remote office space, do give Runway East a check out. They've got lots of locations. Well, yeah, Silicon Brighton. So um, we wouldn't be able to run these events without the support from Silicon Brighton. They they run and support a load of other um, user groups in the southeast. Here are some of them. Here, um, Steve's here, the, the founder of uh, Silicon Brighton. We'll say hi to him. Uh, and what, what they do. Um, so they, they work on sponsorships. They look for, for, for local companies to, to help run the community uh, and it enables them to kind of form and, and run these groups as well. So if you're working in any of these other spaces, um, yeah, please check them out. Um, they, are, they are really good. We're trying to collaborate more with them. And uh, yeah, we'll share some, some news on that in the further slide. Uh, and I think it's really important, like always a big thing from Silicon Brighton is all the events are free to join. So you'll never be asked for any money for it to come and attend and get involved in these awesome communities. They're available to all levels, whether you're starting out or whether you're you know, an advanced pro in these areas. Um, and all the talks were supported by the awesome Charlie, uh, who sorts out all of our AV. So they're hybrid. So if you can't attend one week, um, you can tune into these live on YouTube directly or you can watch them back at any point and they're always available and that's for all of the groups as well. Yeah, do check out their um, YouTube channel. There's, it's like a gold mine of tech talks and everything else. Kind of, yeah, do check it out because there's some really good content in there. Uh, and as uh, Ryan was mentioning, there's lots of local companies uh, that help support uh, the effort with Silicon Brighton uh, and help us fund and do all these amazing things like provide AV, provide food and all of those great things. So um, if you are interested in becoming a sponsor or you work for a company and want to help the local tech community, um, please do get in touch with myself or the team at Silicon Brighton directly and we'll put you in touch. Um, and as Ryan was mentioning, right, we always need more organizers, speakers, sponsors, volunteers, supporters, like no matter how you're starting out um, or if you've got any time available, 
then if in any of these areas, please do come and speak to us because um, I think people who have started to run their own user groups are discovering it's uh, a labor of love um, <laughs> and we love doing it, but it does does require an awful lot of work. And I don't know how me and you did it before the team at Silicon no, Brighton came no. along. So um, when Silicon Brighton reached out to us, like, this is this is a con, this has got to be a con. And yeah. then we were like, oh my God, no, they really are doing it for free in the goodwill <laughs> and it's amazing. So um, yeah, please do get involved in the community. But particularly on the speaker side. I mean, if, if you listen to John's talk tonight and think, yeah, I've done something like that. And it doesn't have to be a tech talk. We're trying to kind of diversify you know, some of the, the subjects that we talk about. If it's a, hey, I did this project or this thing's kind of a bit rubbish in Azure and I think this, it could be better this way. This is how we worked around it or we're waiting for this to come on roadmap. All that kind of stuff we, we really want to hear talks about. And, at, and customer stories is really important because it's, it's great to talk about a, a technology or a white paper, but actually hearing stories from the field where it's been implemented and whether it's been successful or not is, is really good as well. Yeah, like we had Hastings Direct, actually the customer come and do a talk on how they used Azure landing zones and how they you know found good things from it and bad things from it, um, which was, was great to see from a real customer and they got involved and their CTO even came along and gave a, gave a speech at the end and terms of how it's revolutionized their business and people using them as a product. So yeah, some really interesting talks that we can we can help, help host. Uh, and more importantly, if uh, you want to get involved sponsoring, that's always the biggest thing because pizza and beer does not come for free, my friends. Um, we wish it did, <laughs> but every little help. So even if you want to sponsor the odd event, you know, come and speak to us. It's not as much as you may think, but they all help. Um, and these are the values of Silicon Brighton, which I think you've probably got the gist of is basically they're just an awesome bunch of people doing a really great thing in the tech community. Um, and they're all about giving people uh, impact, helping people get amplified in what they're doing, making sure that we're staying up to date and being responsive. Um, it's a good community, like it's a friendship, like you're, where you'll notice there's an event later in the week um, that we'll all just be very good friends. There'll be no, no uh, clicks between groups. Everybody gets on with everybody. Um, and we're starting some collabs with some other groups, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Yes. Um, check them out. There's lots of socials that you can get in, stay in touch and find out about all these amazing events that are coming up. Uh, there's also a Slack channel as well if you're interested that you can get involved in. Uh, and it's always very busy um, with a range of topics. And these are some of the upcoming events. So uh, tomorrow down at Eagle Labs, which is like down the bottom of the hill, uh, Brighton Data Forum a meeting, uh, one that's definitely worth checking out, uh, as well as Brighton AI, the, the hot theme at the moment. Um, Brighton AI a meeting on the 3rd of April. Uh, Brighton Blockchain and Async Brighton, which is uh, two big groups as well, uh, and also Brighton Cloud, which there's an asterisk there because I'll be talking uh, on a panel discussion uh, about uh, cloud wars is the current topic. So there'll be somebody from every cloud represented um, to discuss uh, live Q&A. So it could be a fun one to attend and throw in some questions. I think I'll be hiding in the corner. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so uh, do come along. Um, drinks will be required, I think, for that one. But yeah, do, do come along and check that one out. Uh, I think it's going to be down in the lanes in projects. So another great venue as well. Um, for us, yeah. So um, we've been back and forth on what, we, what we're going to do next, and um, because AI is the hot topic at the moment, everyone's talking about AI, Copilot, Azure AI, all that kind of stuff. Um, Brighton AI are doing a really good job of um, talking about some of the emerging technologies, but also AI as a whole concept, right? So we we're talking about doing a collaboration with Brighton AI, um, doing because we share some information, basically three talks, one around AI ethics, um, and that's kind of quite quite broad, but also what the kind of Microsoft ethics are about AI and you know how that kind of works if you use some of our services. Um, deep tech talk as well on AI and, and then some of the kind of customer use cases and how it can be leveraged for different businesses and everything else. So we're, we're still in the kind of planning phases for that, but pencil in 14th of May, um, in your diary. Yeah, yeah that, 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 was, that, that was confirmed today. today. Yeah, That's so why it's still on there. Start, yeah. um, so yeah, so do do check that one out. We'll be getting out hopefully by the end of the week. Yes. So um, once definitely attend it, we at Platform 9, we expect a good couple of hundred of people to attend that one. So it'll be a really busy event. Uh, and there'll also be a panel discussion at the end of all the speakers uh, yeah. to throw any weird and wonderful AI questions at them. Um, so really good event to, to come and attend if you're interested uh, in that space. Uh, nearly it from us. Um, a couple of you have asked me already tonight, like how do you, like how do you kiss that state with what's going on at Sussex Shore, and how do you know when like new talks are coming? Like the meetup app is great, but not perfect. Um, we have a WhatsApp community, completely optional. Um, but if you scan the QR codes, you can join our WhatsApp community. Um, we post every time that we're announcing a new speaker or we're looking for new speakers, um, so you can get involved there. Uh, and it's not a spam area at all. No, well, um, we've very... had some really good tech chats on there, um, you know, around, you know, I'm trying to do this, how does this work, when's this coming live, all that kind of stuff. So um, it's quite good to just watch some of the uh, 
put some of the chat on there, but yeah, please join. Or even me. rant about NVAs and UDRs as John sometimes does um, <laughs> um, when he has to get raging with them. But yeah, absolutely. It's a great, great place. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, everything's on our YouTube. So um, if you've not been to one of these before and you want to see uh, some previous talks, you'll notice that, John, this is now your fourth time talking here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, but so yeah, yeah, we need a John Craddock playlist. <laughs> Absolutely, I'll get on it. Um, but yeah, there's some great talks here, and you'll see some familiar faces around the room who've also done some amazing talks here. So um, yeah, you can always catch up on our content at any time. Uh, and with that, I hand over to John. Over to the legend himself, Mr. Craddock. Um, thank you very much. Yes. Ah. Uh, now, have I got the right deck? Let me just check. Yeah, I have. Right. So, welcome everyone, and uh, welcome to this little talk about um, Microsoft uh, SSE, or Global Secure Access. I've been involved in Global Secure Access since it's a fairly early concept within Microsoft. And um, I've been working on their private previews. I've also been helping sort of feedback on initial design specs and things like that. And it's gradually getting there. It's still got quite a long way to go, but actually it's beginning to look immensely powerful. So what I want to do is try and introduce you to it this evening and actually go through what's there today. And I'll give you a little bit where I can. You know, I'm a bit restricted by NDAs and things, but I will give you a little bit of a hint of what's coming up fairly soon as well. Okay, so first of all, uh, as an sort of introduction, the whole concept behind this is you've got clients, and the clients could be um, a client machine, which is a user identity on it, or it could be that you've got a workload identity, and the concept is they're anywhere. Right? And what we want to do is we want to get secure access from them through to the applications. Again, applications absolutely anywhere. All right? So any type of application anywhere. So obviously M365, because it's really core cool to Microsoft's uh, money-making efforts, one could say. Um, and then, of course, uh, cloud SaaS apps, and those could be cloud SaaS apps. Uh, they could be just you know, rather than SaaS app, it could be internet access of some kind. And then on-premises and multi-cloud. This is where you host your own applications and you want to give access to them. So as I say, July 2023, this first went into public preview and things have changed a little bit. There are more things coming along very soon though. So there is sort of, where does the SSE come from? Uh, back in 2019, Gartner came up with this secure access service edge. And the whole idea of a secure access service edge was it embodied a number of things. Number one, zero trust network. And I'll go through exactly what the zero trust network is shortly. Um, cloud access security broker. And a cloud access security broker is where we're looking at traffic going to a particular application and we're brokering that traffic and inspecting that traffic. And that's what um, the Microsoft uh, Defender for Cloud Apps will do for you. So that's a component that fits in there. Um, then you've got the secure web gateway. Well, there's a built-in secure web gateway into uh, Microsoft's global secure access now. Okay, That's slowly maturing. It's still got a way to go. Uh, and there's firewall as a service as part of the SASE definition. Um, that's not there at the moment, but it's on its way. Okay. And then as part of the SASE definition, you had the software defined wide area network or SD WAN. Now, that was a step too far for a lot of organizations. So they redefined in 2021, they came up with this concept of SSE, which is all of the above except the SD WAN. And that's what Microsoft have implemented, the SSE. So if we look at what a ZTNA or a zero trust network gives you, um, the whole idea with, there are three tenants to zero trust. Number one is to verify explicitly. So all access is verified, right? And continuously verified. So it's a continuous verification process that goes on. 
The next thing is it's the use least privileged access. Now, least privileged access, it always used to be about administrators. You know, they should never have more power than they need it. But actually, it's really about users now, right? Does a user actually need access to an application? Right? Does a user need access to a network? Because if we can actually expose the applications that user needs as application segments, they don't need to be on a network. And by removing their access to a network, we've dropped the privilege they've got and their potential attack vectors. So that's another concept there. And then the idea is you always assume breach. So what we need to do is detect if the bad guys are in there. So, you know, monitoring is really, really important. And of course, now that's combined with threat intelligence. Problem is you combine it with the threat intelligence, it's a little bit of a nightmare to analyze. So now you've got AI coming in to help with your analysis. And then bringing in as many signals as you can bring in, extended uh, detection and response, and of course, playbooks to, to automate the process as well. So verify explicitly, use least privilege access, and assume breach. Those are the three for a zero trust network access. Now, if you look at a VPN and think about a VPN, what's good about a VPN? And the answer is not an awful lot. Um, because what you've got is some sort of VPN appliance, and then you'll have some controls um, which will allow access to your on-prem applications, and then you'll have some controls where you control access out to the, the wider world. And you know, so the and also the connections have always been to a network rather than to a specific application. As soon as you connect to the network, you open you know, port scanning and everything else that can go along. And of course, your hacker needs to be an authenticated user to get through your VPN, but that's not necessarily such a bad task. But once they're through there, they're on your network and they're looking ways of exploiting. So they're looking at ways of actually scanning and also doing lateral movement and obviously elevating their privilege within the system. The other thing is uh, you've got a fixed appliance. And this was a total nightmare in COVID, all right? A lot of people had VPNs, which were just not capable of supporting suddenly a huge influx of new users. So that's, uh, you know, that was a, a real challenge. Anyone face that challenge? Yeah, quite a few heads bouncing up and down. Lots and lots of companies face exactly that. So scaling, performance, redundancy, challenging and potentially costly. And then the other challenge is hairpinning. So you might be working away in some office somewhere and you need to access, under control of your organization, a SaaS app. And that SaaS app actually happens to be sitting in a data center 100 yards down the road. And, but what you have to do is traverse all the way across the Atlantic in through the VPN and all the way back again, right? So that's another nightmare. So what can we do? Well, we can look at using a, a security service edge. So here, we connect into the service security edge and we connect in through a point of presence, right? So no longer do we have to think about hairpinning. Where do you connect into the security service edge? Wherever you are, right? So hopefully these are available globally and in sufficient quantity. The other thing is, if it's a cloud service, you don't have to think about scalability, you don't have to think about performance, you don't have to think about redundancy. It's all taken care of for you. So we now connect our client in to the service edge. The next thing that happens is we're going to connect out to the applications. And obviously, we need to put the appropriate controls in place for those connections. And we might connect also to on-prem, OK? But what we're looking at is not necessarily on-prem just sitting in your data center on your premises. And a lot of people don't have data centers anymore. They're using cloud services, private cloud for doing this. Um, we need to be able to connect to that. It's really connecting to your applications. And then, of course, we need appropriate security controls. Right? And the beauty of an SSE, if it's cloud-based, those 
security controls can be available and you can add to them as you need to, right? And you obviously probably pay for it. And knowing Microsoft, you'll pay for it. Um, so all access to the SSC and applications are authenticated and continuously verified. How do you get through the SSC? You need to be authenticated, and that's going to be a continuous process. The next thing is access is limited to application segments. We're not putting you on the network, right? What we're doing is allowing you to connect to an application segment, which is going to be, could be by IP, could be by you know, uh, fully qualified domain name, but then it'll be based on a port and a protocol, right? So we will be connecting that way. And then finally, in terms of if we, we want to be able to monitor the traffic behaviors, and uh, that is the assume breach. So the SSC is perfect for monitoring that and bringing in any other instrumentation. Now, if we, if we look at the uh, requirements, what we need, number one, is a fast, highly reliable, secure global network. That's number one. We want geolocated points of presence. So trying to be as close as ever to everyone in the world that we possibly can be. Um, we want high performance and reliability, also virtualization of services, and those virtualization of services want to be geo-distributed uh, as well. And you want best of breed identity and access management, again, implementing a zero trust framework on that. And finally, state-of-the-art threat intelligence and Guess what? Microsoft ticks all of those boxes. And I, I think in terms of threat intelligence and their data pool to analyze and apply their AI to is second to none. I mean, no, no other company has quite as much data to analyze and work out attack vectors and look at behaviors and say, ha ha, this is about to happen or potentially. So they're in a really, really good position. And that's it. Global secure access went into public preview. As I say, you, what you've got is the Microsoft Entra internet access, and then you've got Microsoft Entra private access. And you go, what about M365? That's part of internet access. Okay. And we'll break it down in a minute and look at it in detail. So client to app connectivity. So if you think of that as the, uh, the service edge, and what you've got is the clients on one side, you've got the apps on the other. So our client uh, will connect in. And how do we decide whether we're going to go from the client through to the app? Well, one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to do the authentication. And we're using Entra ID for that. Next thing we're going to do is say, are you allowed to go to that application? And we're going to use conditional access for doing that. Not to all applications, but to, certainly to private and to M365 apps. We need for internet, direct internet connection to an internet service, uh, we'll be using the secure web gateway. So led in there are other security controls. Today, it's the secure web gateway. Tomorrow, I won't say what will be tomorrow because I wouldn't like to predict when Microsoft will come out with the next things, but you'll find things like firewall as a service. You'll find um, all sorts of other goodies that are already in the Microsoft ecosystem will end up being available. Um, and then, of course, we've got their global network. So our client comes in, and somehow we've got to tell the client to go to the edge. That is done through a GSA client that sits on your client machine. And so GSA, I'll show you the GSA clients that are available, but you've got Windows, you've got Android, you've got Mac, iOS available to you today. So we come in, but what traffic do we send? That's based on a traffic profile. But as soon as we come into that edge, we can authend the user. Are they allowed to connect? All right? And we can put in our own CA evaluation. We could say, for instance, through up terms of service, and say, hey, if you connect into our secure edge, you have to agree to this, right? Because it is just standard conditional access policy. So we can add all of that. We've then got three traffic profiles. There's an M365, there's an internet traffic profile, 
and there's a private access uh, traffic profile. And those profiles are what traffic should be sent to the edge. And that is actually uh, uh, picked up by the GSA client. So the GSA client will periodically poll for this information and bring it down. We then got our connections to our apps. And if we're going to M365, then absolutely every single app we can identify, and therefore we can do, uh, we can do AuthN to it, and we can also do CA. So this AuthN over on here on the left-hand side has got us onto the network, right? The AuthN over there is getting us to the app. So again, conditional access policy comes in and we can apply whatever policies we want to do. The, the next thing is we are going to go over to uh, sort of internet websites and, uh, you know, SaaS apps and so on. And to do that, um, we're going to use internet access. And with internet access, you've got the secure web gateway. And to go with that, there are filters or policies or profiles, whatever you want to call them, which say which applications you're allowed to go to. And they are categorized by web category. So Microsoft have web categories of the type of sites. And you can also do them by a fully qualified domain name. And uh, so again, I will show you that shortly. And then uh, in terms of private access, we're going to connect down to your on-prem or into one of the clouds where you're hosting your own services. Again, I'll show you that in action. And to do that, we're using a connector. And if you're familiar with the, um, the application proxy in Enter ID, it's the same connector now. For a while, it was a different connector, but it was basically they matured and really streamlined the app proxy connector. So it's way faster. And now it's compatible with both, which is just as well. Um, so that's that. And again, over here, we can do AuthN. And then you say, ha ha, but what about a branch office where we've just got lots of machines? And what about all those Linux machines we're running and everything else? Well, what you can do is create a remote network. And it's using IPsec, aka v2, to come in and how does it know what's a route? Well, it does it through uh, BGP advertising. Uh, at the moment today, all internet traffic is routed. If you have the internet profile, so let's just step back one. You don't have to have all three profiles. You can say, all I'm interested is M365 traffic, right? Or all I'm interested is private traffic or internet. Um, if you have internet traffic, then all internet traffic is currently routed to the edge, right? At the moment, there's no, you can't break it out at all. You can, you can block it going from the, the edge to the target, but you, at the moment, you cannot change that. So if you test it in preview as it is today, that's what will happen, all right? In the future, Watch this space. <laughs> oh, yes, of course, we, we've got the, yeah. Uh, I just want to make sure I've understood this, because this is, this is all new to me. So you install a client on your device, yep. and that hits the secure edge, whatever that is. I don't even know what that is. Is it just a thing in Entra? It's, 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 a, it's a set of IPs, Entra, if you be like. Yeah, it's a set. Yeah, it's that's all. And yes. then that now sees you on the network. And then from there, you can get to your own VMs or whatever behind private networks, et cetera. Yep. Simple. Yep. That's it. Uh, yeah. As simple as that. All right. And the, be the beauty it's is. You've got to find a client to test it on. The, the, be the, <laughs> the beauty is, of course, those points of presence right, that you connect to are distributed throughout the world. So you don't hairpin, you know, if you don't hairpin back through, your, you just literally, you basically, the client fires up, the client gets its profile information and connects in to the closest point of present that it can. Yeah, a really good way of thinking about this is Zscaler or Zscaler. It, it's effectively a competitive product to that. 
in a Obviously, way. competitive product, a lot of things. Lots yes. of things. But yeah. Zscaler is one that most yeah. people have worked with or had to play with. So yeah, it's like Z private access and layer instant access as well. Know its closest point of presence, or do you have to set it up to a main point? It, it has a series of like geo stuff. Yeah. At, at last count, as uh, these kind of thing is 156, um, like uh, 250 uh, is one high number, and um, point uh, like their pops where you can connect into, um, but you have to do it. On a network level, you can't do it as like any car, so it doesn't go to whichever one it thinks is close. You have to go and select. So there is a bit more admin. You would so on your branch office with the BGP routing, you would say, "Oh, I want this IPsec tunnel to go to this specific IP address." Whereas this is very much like, "I'll go here and any car will sort it out." Yeah, I mean, if, if you if you're using if you're using branch office, obviously, it's a branch office located at a particular location. So when you establish the branch office connection, it will go into the right location. I mean, if you took your branch office on your laptop and moved it somewhere, uh, it probably it would still connect to the original location. But the client will connect in to wherever it is uh, in the world. <laughs> this one's going to happen again. It's like bicep all over again. <laughs> Will the client back off if it's behind branch office? You mean if it's inside the branch office? Yeah, like it's not going to double encrypt everything and send it weird and wonderful places. Uh, not, not, not automatically. So if you've got if you've got the the client enabled and it could get it would it would um, it would probably take precedence today. But okay. it's certainly something that is it will be detected. That it's in, a, in a, that scenario, and that would um, it would yeah it would back off. Cool. Um, one one last one. So we said about the um, being able to do CA evaluation. Yeah. Can it be any certificate? Could you could you or does it have to be the oh. Oh, oh, okay, it's a good time. Oh, to, sorry. Okay, yes. Because I saw uh, conditional C access C in the middle. CA is as in continuous access evaluation. Fair enough. I, oh yeah, oh, never mind. There we go. Then. Never mind. That's good. Can, I, can I ask one last <laughs> yeah. one, one? And obviously, I'm a big fan of private endpoints. But how, how does this work with DNS? So if you've got private endpoints in the cloud, how does it resolve? Let Let me Let me come. You mean so on your? Okay. Um, I don't know whether I'm best to answer it now. I'll answer it now, but I'm going to show you a little bit. So what, what, what happens is um, when you publish something that's in, let's say it's yours rather than, we're not saying where it is, it's yours. Okay. So you're, you're setting it up as a private access. What you'll do is you can give it an IP or you can give it a fully qualified domain name, right? So your IP would be a private IP. So here we are, all connected up. You're, you're out on the internet here, right? And you've published something at 10.0.0.6. And you think, well, how on earth, if I ping 10.0.0.6, how does it know? Well, it knows that that was published in the private access profile, right? So it says, aha, what I need to do is send it to the edge and then the edge will send it to the connector that is connected to that target application, right? So, so that's, that's how that works. Now, you asked a question about DNS. So with DNS, uh, again, this is not in public preview at the moment, but Microsoft have talked about it enough, so I think it's safe to talk about it. You've got this concept of private DNS. So now you can publish uh, private DNS and say that, on this particular site, I have a DNS server which looks after the XYZ domain, right? And then it says, aha, to resolve the XYZ domain, what I have to do is go to that published service and actually resolve it for you. And that's the private DNS aspect. Nice. That, that you will not see today, but um, it's, it's also part of uh, the moment the private uh, private access is TCP in public preview, but UDP and private DNS are coming along yeah. very soon. 
This looks really good for those customers who are completely cloud native and have got no on-premise sort of infrastructure whatsoever. This is a bit of a silver bullet in my mind. But yeah. I mean, it's, it is, it's a game changer, this, actually. Yeah. Right. Let's, um, so what I want to do is give you a little demo. of, um, And I've actually got, uh, I've got, I've got, did you have a question? You said about um, it's TCP at the second. So sending quad zero traffic, TCP only, up to the service. Everything else, any other protocol, it won't send. So, so it, it does TCP and it does UDP. But okay. it doesn't do UDP in the, the public preview that you can get your hands on today. Okay. Cool. All right? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, but very soon. Maybe. It's been coming. <laughs> it's it's been coming for. I I, I did a, a YouTube video with one of the uh, uh, the, the the guys that works. Well, one of the Microsoft guys, and and I asked exactly the question. So when's UDP coming? Oh, expect it within a few months. That was a year ago. <laughs> well, not quite, but yeah, it's 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 sometime sometime in the future. And yeah. hopefully reasonably near. Is there anything because anything to do with them trying to measure bandwidth or measure traffic going across and tie I, it to I, To be honest, I don't I don't know what the delay okay. is. I've not been privy as to. I'm I'm surprised it's taken so long. Fair enough. Um, and and I, I don't know what the 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 actual. So what I want to do first of all is actually just. Uh, so I I've done these demos as a little bit of hybrid demos uh, because there's a latency in applying. The settings. Um, what I've got is where I want to show you a, a particular setting. Um, I've recorded a little video, but then I thought I would show you live in the portal where those changes are actually made. So here we are in the Entra portal. If we go down the very bottom, sitting down here is Global Secure Access Preview. And if I go in uh, down here and I go into connection, I've got the, the client downloads. And here we've got Windows, Android, iOS, and Mac OS. So that's available right now today. Okay, so you can you can do that. You've got those. Um, if I look at the remote network under here, under connect, this is where you establish a remote network. Uh, and of course, you need your customer premises equipment uh, to actually establish the um, IPsec tunnel. You can use an Azure um, virtual network gateway uh, if you want to. Uh, if you do and you put that up, there's, there's an example of how to set it up in the Microsoft documentation. Uh, just watch the cost because it is not cheap. Uh, and before you know it, you'll be burning dollars, especially if you set it up in redundant mode. Um, so just be careful on that. And then, and then you've got here the traffic forwarding. And this is where you decide which profiles you're going to use. So I've got all three profiles enabled. And if I look, for instance, at my M365 traffic profile, I can look at Exchange Online. And in fact, it's showing me what is being forwarded to the edge. But I can always, if I don't want to, I can do a bypass on it. And the whole design behind all of this is that if you've already got a solution, and you want to stick with it, you can do side by side. So you can actually do a side by side install and decide who handles which traffic. Okay. So that, that's the that's the the thing there. And if I look at my, I've got a couple of linked uh, conditional. These are conditional access policies, um, and I'll come back on those. Uh, private access. I've actually got. Um, three applications published at the moment. I, I've got a thing called Web Hub, RDP, and um, SMB. And I'll show you how those get published later on. For internet access, at the moment, um, it's all of the internet traffic. So it's uh, HTTPS on, um, on TCP over IPv4 uh, is uh, on, again, standard ports 80 and 443. All of that is being sent currently to the edge, all right? Though, but as I say, that can change. Sorry? Um, do you want to do it? Uh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yes. 
Yes, I wasn't, I wasn't sure I had the Zoom capability on this one, but yes. Um, okay, so. So your web traffic that's not, sorry, <laughs> so Your web traffic as per that, that profile, what happens if it's not those ports specifically? At, at the moment, it doesn't deal with it. All right. Okay, so, 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 so this, this, this profile is very crude today. Yep. Right. Expect this. This this profile. Um, so what happened is when they released in July, um, you had the M365 profile, which is actually quite mature. Right. And in fact, if you didn't see that because we were, um, where are we? Here we go. Traffic policies. Uh, I'll zoom in on on this. So you know, it's um, that that itself is, is quite sophisticated. Um, and and that, that this came out, private profile came out, the internet profile didn't. So if you started looking in July and then at some point, I think it was a Christmas present it came out, <laughs> right? So I think it was a, that, that sort of time. Um, so expect it to mature. Ages ago, I remember working with people that wanted to, you know, peer with M365 over Express Route and make all of that traffic private. Do you think that this is where this has kind of really driven this product? Um, <clears throat> I think Microsoft realized that they had, you know, everything that was needed for a SSE and there was a market for it. But I think, you know, the, the primary objective obviously is M365. Yeah. Um, because the, the thing is, once you're going through the edge, uh, man of the middle attacks of a thing of the past, uh, you know, uh, t stealing tokens and, and playing them in to try and get access is a thing of the past. So your whole access is, is you know, that step further in terms of, um, uh, you know, m maturity in terms of security. So is this product really targeting, uh, sorry, uh, so uh, for the domain giant machines who are working from home, is it like, you know, if an organization wants to uh, give access to their M365 applications, so for example, I'm an employee of a XYZ co company and I have a laptop given by that company. So if I'm working from home, am I the target user? Yep. Like perfect. Then we just get, just just deploy a client onto your machine. Yeah. And and job's done. Okay. So yeah, if you're not in network. You are at home and you are a company join machine. Okay, so to connect to your uh, company applications, it's so currently I think my organization is using Jetscaler to do that. So this SSE is a replacement product to uh, Gscaler. Yeah, yeah, I mean you'll you'll see you'll see ah, okay. it it appear in a lot of products. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, so and then and then what you you if we go to the client itself, and as I say the uh, so I've, I've got my client over here. Let me just close that off. And if I go, I can see. Um, well, hopefully you can see. There it is, running with a a green tick. Uh, they've actually got some really quite nice diagnostic because it's not you you can't actually because it's all tunneled, all right. Um, and is using gRPC as the the tunneling mechanism, which is very fast and very efficient. Um, and um, the, you 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 need this sort of advanced diagnostic capability that we've got. Um, and so it checks the health of absolutely everything. Uh, don't worry about this. I I sh I shut it down badly. So. Um, but it gives you, so you've got the overview, which tells you the version number, et cetera. It'll do a health check and take you through all the different components. There's a lot of components involved in this. Um, it shows you the traffic forwarding program profiles that the client thinks it's got and the information from that. By the way, the traffic forwarding profile ends up in a registry key. And what you can do is you can dump that key. Uh, it's JSON and you can analyze exactly what the client thinks it's doing. Um, you've got host name acquisition, which is for DNS, and then you've got this rather nice traffic monitor, so I can 
start collecting on that, for instance, and I could go to, uh, where are we? Let's go here, and that's my identity masterclass, shameless plug. <laughs> um, but you can see, can you see there, it's going to 6.6.0.228. Soon as you see 6.6, .6, it's the SSE edge. All right, and so it, it shows uh, what's, what's actually going on there. Um, okay, so, uh, and also you'll see that the action here, I can find my, uh, my mouse, is tunnel, right? So it's actually only showing stuff that's tunneled. It's also only showing stuff that's coming out of the global secure access client. Okay, so, so that's that. Um, if I go to, uh, you know, if I go to SharePoint, um, that takes me straight through to SharePoint, which, you know, you'd expect it to work, and that will have gone to 6.6. .6. Uh, I'll show you more detail of that shortly. And, you know, if I go to an SMB share, which is sitting on my private network, and um, there's my data from my SMB share, actually directly and the connection is purely to that application segment right it's purely to the smb port John, in the logging can, can you use it to dump out stuff that's not coming from the client so everything that's going straight out that's maybe not four four three or eighty um in this in, in there's not coming from the client itself yeah just the filter where it said the executable for, for that if you were to remove that filter, will it just ah? But the it? client, the client's very low-level uh, filter, down at, you know, very very low level, so it actually picks up everything. Yeah. All network traffic goes through the client. Um. Okay, SMB. Oh yes, I wanted to go to just to the logs. So we go back over to here. And we go down to, so what you've got is, uh, in terms of monitoring, is you've got audit logs, you've got traffic logs, which I'll show you, deployment logs, remote network, which is the branch office logs, uh, enriched M365 logging as well. Um, and, and also, um, what will happen, of course, when we hit M365, it will think it's coming from the edge. But what it does is source IP restoration. So we get the proper IP address in there. And then you've got workbooks available. But let's just look at the traffic logs. And I can go in here, for instance, and go, uh, no, not to columns, so I didn't want to go there. I can go into add a filter and do it via like FQDN. And um, wh where did we go? We went to learn, didn't we? So that will, we apply that filter. Uh, it can show all the traffic, and it says it was allowed, all right? We got the source IP, uh, which is the, the correct source IP, so that's to learn. Now, the interesting thing is, when I publish the SMB share, actually, just in case you can't see that, so we know who the user is, we know where we've gone to, which is learn.xt seminars, um, and then, um, as I say, the source IP for that. Okay, if I just go back on there, cancel that off, and we'll close that and add a filter where I start with the destination IP, all right? And you go, I'm gonna go to 10.0.0.7. And you think, how on earth can that work? Well, I publish 10.0.0.7, and it knows that what will happen is it's part of my private profile. And it's for my tenant. So obviously in my tenant, I can't have overlapping IP addresses. But if somebody else is using 10.0.0.7, it doesn't matter because it's in their tenant, right? So it's in their profile. So if I apply that, um, what we can see is we've actually, um, the destination we can see who got there and the fact it was allowed and so on. So I think that gives you a little bit of an idea of, of how it's operating. Okay, let's go, let's go back to the slide deck. And so conditional access, as in not certificates, but conditional access. Um, the, the idea behind conditional access is it's a sort of test. 
And it's if principal X, and who's principal X? Well, user, group, administrator, whatever you want, could be workload identity as well, right? Uh, wants to access resource Y, and this, this, is, this is just generic, okay? Now, resource Y typically started off as just being an application. So if user X wants to access an application, right, let's do some control. Well, now um, that's changed, and it could be a task they're performing, could be, but to meet the requirements of the SSE, that is now a network as well. So we have the potential of saying, if user X or principal X wants to access the internet, right, what are we gonna do? The next thing is we've got conditions, A to G, and we've got a new condition built in there. Conditions are things like, you know, what's your, um, what's your client device, right? What's the operating system? What's the location? Well, we've got a new location now that's been added to the condition. And that new location is you are coming from a compliant network. So if you're coming, so you can actually control a conditional access policy which says you can only hit SharePoint if you're coming from the edge, as in you're coming from a compliant network. And then if what will happen is provided you meet everything and requirements, so requirements are things like uh, multi-factor authentication and various other bits and pieces. If you meet all those, um, then um, we, we can go through to the next stage. The policy applies. One of the things from the policy could be that we block access. But if we want to go to the internet, what we do is in the session control, we put a filter from the secure web gateway, which says what internet resources we're allowed to gain access to. Right? And I'll, I'll show you all of that as we go through. So new CA options. So here, we've got the resource. And in there, what you can see, uh, it's a bit faint. You've got Microsoft M365 traffic, internet, and at the moment, grayed out is the public. Okay. So this is, if you are going there, right, what do you want to do? The next one in there is a new condition. And this condition, which is basically saying you are coming from a compliant network. Okay, so we can put that condition in there. And then the last new CA is in the session control. And right down the bottom, actually, what I'll do is I think I'll zoom in on that because it's not super easy to see on that screen. In the session control, it says use global secure access security profile. And that's the security profile I created. Okay, we'll come back on that and see that in action shortly. So what I want to do is I, I want to do a, a little demo of where we're working with um, actually going, well, we'll see. I, what I've got is I've got a little recorded demo because of the delays involved, all right? And then I'll take you into the UX. So let's start off with the recorded demo. So I'm going to SharePoint and we get to SharePoint now. You'll have to take my word for it. I'm going through the secure edge, all right? So that you'll see, you'll see you can trust me on that in a minute. I'm going to sign out as uh, my user, James Bond. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to disable the GSA client. So I'm going to pause it. Now, when I go to SharePoint, I will be going over the internet, right? And I'd be going over the, the real internet. Okay, so off we go now to SharePoint. And we're being going to be asked to sign in again because I logged James Bond out and you can't access it right now. And that, that is because we have a conditional access policy that says to get to SharePoint, you must be coming from a compliant network. Okay, let's, let's have a look at that policy. So if I go across to, um, where are we? Up here, protection, conditional access, and I go to my policies, and I've got 
my uh, serial number for all my SSE policies begins SSE, uh, just to make life easier. So SSE 005 is SharePoint Compliant Network for James Always. Um, I always write my, um, the, the, the names of my policies so you can actually understand them. So, to get, so it's basically to get to SharePoint, you've got to come from a compliant network. Who's this apply to? James. Now, normally it wouldn't be James, it would be a group. But in my dev environment, I always use the username. Um, I always use a user rather than putting in a group because otherwise I'm going to remember who I put in the group and you know, if I'm testing. And, and then um, are there any con other conditions applied? No, it's always, all right? So uh, let's have a look at that policy. And if we go down and actually examine it, uh, what it is, it's um, uh, we've got uh, a specific user included, which is James. The app is SharePoint, which we've got in there. And then the condition, and if I look at the condition and what we look at, it's all locations, okay? We're saying this policy will apply from all locations except all compliant network locations. So this policy will not apply if you're coming from a compliant network. And then what you've got is the policy, actually the grant control on the policy is block. All right, so unless you're on a compliant network, bang, that's it, you're blocked. So that, that's that one in operation. So by having going through this edge, you've got you know, that nice control available to you. Okay, let's, uh, let's progress onwards. And um, so we go back to our PowerPoint. So next job, internet access. So here, um, and, and, and remember, Microsoft talk about internet access. Internet access includes M365 access, but actually it's different. It has a different profile as well. So you've got an internet profile and you've got an M365 profile. Now we're talking about the internet profile. So here, um, in terms of internet access, in the current preview, and this answers your questions, all traffic is routed, right? So all traffic, and if you're on branch network, all traffic will go up, right? If you're sitting with a GSA client, all internet traffic is going to go up. Um, and but it's only, remember, it's only if you're going to port 80, 443, HTTPS, HTTP, right? So that, that's the current situation. So there's an inbuilt uh, secure web gateway. And what it does is it allows or blocks access based today on a fully qualified name or a web category, right? You've also got, um, I, and I don't like this, what they've done here, but you know, I'm allowed to say that because I don't have to say I love everything Microsoft. Um, I, I don't like the naming they've used. They, they have a profile, right, which actually gets applied by conditional access policy, right? And um, normally the, the profile range is 100 to 65,000 in terms of priority. The lower number is a higher priority in terms of applying the profile. So if I had a block at 200, but an allow at 100, right, the allow would take precedence. So you've got to bear in mind, normally conditional access, you apply it, and if you've got a deny in there, you're denied, all right? So if it's a block access, you'd be blocked. But in this case, with these profiles, um, you know, it's whatever's the high precedent. Now, 65,000, is a special profile and it gets applied even if you haven't put it into conditional access. So it gives you the capability of doing a baseline profile. Okay, so that's, that's that. Now here's the schema. And so you've got a profile. I'm not sure, it, I don't know that I, I particularly like the term profile there, but that's, you know, thing. Um, it's either play, applied by CA in all situations applied by conditional access, unless it's 65,000, in which case it's applied without it, right? The next thing is there's a number of policies. 
and you have one or more policies and they're linked to the profile, right? And those policies are allow or block, right? So they're really at a rule which says allow or block access will come to what in a second, right? Um, and again, they're prioritized, right? So if you had multiple policies, right, the lowest priority one would win. Right. Um, 65,000 has no significance or no special significance in the, the policies. The only time it has a significance is in the profile. And then you have rules, which I think are rather more think of them as targets. This defines your targets you're going to go to, right? Because I don't believe they're a rule personally, but you know, it's a definition of a target. And that definition of a target is either using uh, a, a fully qualified domain name. So let me zoom in, I'll just actually, or it could be via a web category. So let me just zoom that. So fully qualified domain name, and it looks like you can put lots in there. You can't, you can only put one, all right? Um, so it, that's, just, that's just to frustrate you. Um, the other thing to be very careful of, if you put star.microsoft.com, right, and you go to microsoft.com, it won't apply. Because, and this is actually fairly standard in firewall far rules. If you've got a star in there, it expects something to be there. So star.microsoft.com will be www.microsoft and learn.microsoft.com, all the rest of it, and it will apply. But if you just go to Microsoft.com, it doesn't apply. And there's, there's talk about changing that. And then down the bottom is the web category. And you've got alcohol, tobacco. And I, I didn't select these ones, by the way. These are the ones that just came up in order. Child abuse images and criminal activity. And you know, so it goes on. And I, I don't know. Do you know the story behind how they got categorized? Yeah, they probably did something. Um, but of course, if you go to uh, if you go to uh, Sainsbury's and look up alcohol, it doesn't block you. <laughs> so you can still buy uh, alcohol from Sainsbury's. But um, so so those these <laughs> the, these are why I think the um, I, I prefer to call them targets rather than rules. But there you go. <laughs> Okay. So with the profiles, can the profiles stack? So you said profile one, can you have like two profiles? Or something? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I can put in, I can put in multiple, but they can't stack within a condition, single conditional access policy. Okay. What I'd have to do is create, if I wanted to apply five profiles, I'd create five conditional access policies. Perfect. Um, the, yeah, the rest is all, all fantastic. So in this, obviously we're doing AEM443. Um, you've got allow and block. It's normal to see in places here, like stuff like do not inspect. Um, is that, am I kind of not looking at the right sort of place to say something that does like certificate pinning? You mean, you mean inspection in terms of- um, Decrypting a packet. In, yeah, okay, the at, the moment, at the moment, it doesn't do inspection of HTTPS traffic. Oh, okay, so it's just looking at, at yes. the domain. Yes, but just again, watch this space. Oh, do, do you know, I, I thought it did um, SSL inspection. And, no, uh, no, uh, no, no, not, 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 not today. Okay, no worries. Cool, okay. questions over, thank you. Okay. <laughs> right, so a little little demo of this. So so what I've got here is I actually, um, with, with this one, I, I've got um, a, a baseline policy which is gonna block absolutely everything, right? So um, if I go to uh, learn.xts and what it's doing, because it's not doing inspection, this is quite an interesting one, um, it can't tell you why that it's blocked it because it's not opening the traffic, right? If it opened the traffic, it could actually give you a message back to say it had blocked it, okay? But it can't do that today. All right, so if I go to Amazon, exactly the same problem. And if I just show you that if I go to uh, here, learn, but HTTP learn, 
it because I've gone with an HTTP request, it can see that it's going. It can tell me that it's blocked me. All right. So the question is, should you have two different error messages? I don't think you should. But um, what what the, there's a, there's another method they could do because it's the edge. They can talk to their GSA client, so they can explain why to the GSA client why it got blocked. So we could see it. But once you do a TLS inspection, then you can have the same message. But maybe does everyone doesn't want TLS inspection, right? So there's lots of little you know gotchas along the way as to how to handle things properly, which which makes it very interesting. I said no, but I mean yeah. Um, I suppose stuff like Casby, you would want. Like SSL inspection, you know, most stuff is kind of hidden within a payload. Security, you go, oh, it's, it's within that SSL payload. Um, so, do you do you think kind of having having that is like in like incipient? It's kind of on. You close. mean ha having sorry, having what? Having the inspection? I suppose, yeah, being able to return like your browser just saying, oh no, I, I don't know what's being responded to me because it's it's not. Well, it's, it's yeah, just it's just, it's just a, a connection termination. So yeah, you know, and the browser can respond to that. Yeah, so exactly. You know. I, I suppose as well, like if you're going to perform like a 302 back to your client and say, oh, my client's going to present a message, even a pop up like says, oh, you know, you've been yeah, denied. I, I, I personally, I think it could just block access. Yeah. Um, and, and what I don't like is the two the the two different things. So you go to HTTPS, it blocks without telling you why. You go to HTTP, and it tells you why. I think it should be consistent. Yeah, I, I suppose that's just the way the HTTPS is gonna it's gonna work. If if there's no certificate for that response to come back in, it's not gonna see within it and you know, block and whatnot. So yeah. with um on. On the other security parts that we spoke about earlier, so right at the beginning of your thing, you said, oh, Microsoft does it all. And um, we obviously had CASB and a few other things in there. So how, how does that kind of apply to um, to to this if we're not doing certain things like SSL inspection? Well, I think I think you just have to wait for the maturity to come <laughs> along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I think that's the the answer to that. Yeah, yeah, no, cool. I, I think it's essential that the inspections there makes sense. Yeah. yeah, and and you know the the uh, firewalls as a service should be there as well, and so on. But you know, watch your space. Talk to the Microsoft guys; they'll know exactly yeah. where it's all coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let, let me just show you that I've got um, in here. So if I go to um, uh, this site here. I'm allowed access. So xtshub.com is being set up as a profile, and it has a lower number, all right? So it, therefore, it takes precedence, all right? So if we actually um, look at that, and, and what I can do is I can go um, and look at the, uh, where did I want to go, actually? Yeah, I was going to go to the um, the profiles for starters and just take you through those so you can see them. Um, and where are we down here? So I've got um, where are we? Yeah, security profiles. I've got uh, I've got a baseline profile, and notice it's sixty five thousand. Okay, and then I've got an allow XTS hub profile which has a priority of 200, right? So that is going to take precedence if both of those are applied, which they are at the moment. Now, the 65,000 one, and unfortunately, I can't click. I, I can only click one level in this. So I can say, see my baseline uh, profile, and the linked policies are there, and the linked policy is all websites. But I can't click on this and see what... Microsoft call as the rules are the targets. What I can do though is go to um, uh, where are we? I've just lost it. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I can go in here and I can look at the um, where are we? All websites. So all websites. It's block, right? That's the action. And then the rules of the target here is in terms of fully qualified name. It's just a wild card. 
Okay, so that that will uh, that applies. Now the other one, which is just close that off and come in here, uh, allow xtshub.com. Uh, the rule it's an allow, and the rules in here are star.xtshub.com. Okay, um, and I'm going to oidc v1.xtshub.com. So if I look at my um, if I look at my conditional access, I can come in here and I can go down to, uh, I go to all policies. And what I've got in here is allow xtshub.com. So it's the specific user included. It's one network traffic profile. So it's internet traffic. And under, there's no conditions, there's no grants or denies or blocks or anything like that. So there's no requirements. But when I have a session, I need this particular profile. Okay? So that's the one that will actually be executed. And because it's sitting at, I think it was 200, wasn't it? Because it's sitting at 200, then uh, it will take presence over the baseline. Okay? So... so so there are profiles like public, private, and M365. And again, on top of that, there are, again, another profiles. So, so th this profile is from the Secure Web Gateway. Oh, okay. And it's purely for internet traffic. Oh, okay. And, and you can actually think you can apply it to an M365, but it doesn't. It applies just to internet. Oh, okay. okay. So it's just, just for dealing with the internet traffic. Okay. Thank okay. you. Um, and then, and then, just to to sort of finish looking at this section. Sorry, I... um, where's uh, your Entra uh, profile set up in this to obviously access Entra and not be blocked? Does that come under the internet profile, or is no, it? So, so log on to Entra is handled through the M three sixty five profile. Oh, okay. So, you know, it's it's part. It obviously has to be. Yeah, you can block it. yourself otherwise. Yeah, and, uh... yeah, yeah. So that, that's handled through that. Okay. Um, and if I go to the traffic logs, this is actually quite nice. So if I set up a, uh, add a filter and go for a destination fully qualified domain name, um, XTS, uh, no, let's, let's, do, um, let's do learn first of all and apply that. And if we come down here, um, can you see, I, I, I recorded that little video this morning. There, there's the block. You see, we, we've got a block in there. So it's showing trouble. I can't, uh, I thought I couldn't move my mouse. Well, I can if I press the button. <laughs> but then it, so there's the block. And you go, oh, yeah, okay, but what blocked it? Well, what's quite nice is I can go and actually go to columns and then I can choose the filtering profile name, the filtering policy name, and the filtering rule name. Save that. And then coming down here, block, it was the baseline profile or website, and the target was star. Okay. Um, and, and also, um, if I go in here, and actually, um, if I go to the... Uh, sorry, should have gone in here. XTS hub. And apply that. And we look for the block on XTS. Um, there's the block. Yeah. So that, that was when I had it blocked. All right. And, and what I've got in here is I've got the allow and we've got the filtering that's taking place. So it's allow and the filtering policy is allow in here. Um, and, and what, what I did is I actually, I applied, and I thought I wouldn't spend time doing it, but I applied a lower priority number block policy just to show that it actually does it. So if you have a block policy in a conditional access and you have an allow, if the blocks are the lower precedence, it will block it. So that's, that's what happened actually here. So we've got the, the block, which is showing that the block policy, so it's actually showing the block policy was used 
and the allow is showing that the allow policy was used. Okay, so it is, it is you know, the, the logging and everything else is actually really, really helpful because without it, you wouldn't have a clue what was going on. Right. Hmm? In, in terms of creation of condition, like, oh, absolutely, 100%. Yes, so the question was, can you script them? And yes, absolutely, no, no problem at all. Uh, basically, they're, J they're based on JSON. Check out M365 DSC. Um, if none of you are using it, it's a set of desired state config PowerShell modules. We can literally suck out your entire tenant's data. So you could literally go, that one we've done really well. Put all that out and then go dump it over there. Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, it's an open source thing written by a load of uh, smart people in fast track for Azure. So um, it's open source, but it's supported by us and vetted by engineering. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. M365 DSC is very cool. Now I'm aw I'm aware that we've uh, we run over time, but are we are we okay to? Uh... Is everybody still with us? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's quite interesting. Then we've asked too many questions. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's my turn to ask. Okay. All right. I, I, I have one question, John. Yes. Before will we carry on? Um, what stops a user to disabling the client? In, in terms of actually disabling the client itself. Yeah, like, well, I don't want to use your internet filtering policy, thanks. Yeah. In, in terms of you, you want to go directly to it, well, you, you, you would have to be an administrator to disable it. But equally well, you, um, I mean, if M365, then you wouldn't be able to use any of the M365 services because sure. you've got conditional access policy on there. Um, so, you know, it is, it is reasonably protected. Yeah, but it's just standard normal Windows admin. Like, I suppose yeah, you could put an yeah. Intune policy in place that stops people touching it. Well, I mean, you know, if you if you own the machine, yeah, right, then you might as well have brought your own machine in and do what you like, <laughs> you know. Um, but if you're in branch office, if you don't trust them, stick them on a branch office, and all the traffic, <laughs> all the traffic will go up. <laughs> Yeah, that's got to be the point. Like at, at home, you can kind of say, "Oh, you get only get access to our services if you're at home and you, you're using our thing to get access to our services." If not, you know, go fish. If you're in the office, yeah, exactly what you said. It, it makes sense to kind of BGP tunnel. Oh, sorry, BGP up through that tunnel. Makes sense. That was it. Agreement. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. <Yes>. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, pri private access. So let's see if we can get through this reasonably snappily. So the whole idea of private access is that we're going to publish our, and I'm going to use this term, our own applications, right? Whether they be, you know, on-prem, in a cloud, there are applications that we control access to. So what we use is a connector, and this is using, it's, a, it's the app proxy connector. So we have an endpoint in our cloud, we, and you'll, you'll find that there are going to be VMs with endpoints built in and things. Um, and then we've got our published application behind it. So it's based on um, an IP, a fully qualified domain name and port. Currently, it's only TCP, right? UDP is there. I mean, I've actually, I can, no. I've got UDP operational. So any resource you like, RDP, SSH, SMB, and so on. Um, the idea at the moment is HTTPS and Kerberos constraint delegation is still via the Entra application proxy. I would expect to see that probably roll into the rest of SSE at some point in the private access publication. But it works, and it works really well. And you know they want to get all the other things working. So I think that's fair enough. Um, so how do we publish an app? Um, we basically specify an IP address. We could do, or we could use um, FQDN. Um, we put the IP in, in there, the port number. We also choose the protocol. Can't see that on here, but it would be uh, TCP, UDP. Um, and uh, unlike the proxy, there's no concept of an external internal URL. Well, if you're going to SMB share, there aren't URLs involved in it, all right? So with, that's the way it's published. And what you need to do is you uh, create this 
or publish this app, it ends up as an enterprise app, right? And then what you need to do is to get through it, you need to assign users to it. So if you don't assign users, you can't use it. So what we can do is, you know, you can decide exactly who's allowed to use this. Now, and also because it's an enterprise app, you can apply conditional access policy to it. So you can have SSH, which now has MFA on it, if that's what you want to do. Okay, um, so we've got to grant the user and we can apply conditional access policies. There are, as in, if you, if you know the app proxy, you'll know about connector groups. So the idea is you want to connect, you've published this thing, right? we'll just say it's available, right? Here is where it actually exists. We've somehow got to communicate from our cloud to where it actually is. So we need to come down through a connector. But obviously, we want those connectors to be fault tolerant. So we need a number of connectors, and we put them in a connector group. Right? So you connect your app to the connector group. Now, what you can have is multiple connector groups, because your physical apps could be in different locations, in which case you'd have you connect to this connector group to go to this data center, this one to go to another data center, this one to go to another. So you can create these connector groups. Um, there's quick access, which is basically, hey, one app, publish the lock, right? And then what it will do is it will give you logs to show who's using what, right? So we can publish everything, all our segments, through one application, right? Or we can do per app access. So you have one for RDP, you have one for SMB, you have, you know, if we do it quick access, it's just basically, oh yeah, connect through here, and you've got access to SMB, RDP, SSH, everything else you want, okay? Sorry? Oh yeah, yeah, we must do it officially. <laughs> so so <clears throat> with them, um, you've got the per app access and the quick access. The quick access, like, you know, through this connector, you could access the subnet. Yeah, say, well, like no, three... not a subnet, but you could access the application. So you could, pub okay. you could publish all your applica application segments through this one thing. And then, and then it really collects good comprehensive logging okay. to show who's used what, right? So then you can make a decision to go over to per app access and controlling, oh, yeah, you know, these people need access to this, these people need access to that, and so on. So it's a migration path, basically. No worries. I know with um, like other app, uh, like other products. Sorry, cross. I forget the word. Then um, there's things like you can install a like a connector VM appliance or like a connector thing that would sit and provide access to a subnet. Is there anything that you can do like that? And the only reason I'm kind of bringing this up in, as a potential reason you'd want to do is say, for example, if you was developing something, and maybe yeah, you, no, didn't you, know you, you can't provide any internet access. Oh, sorry, uh, less, less to internet, but more like to a range of Say for you've got a VNet, and inside that VNet you've got you know, five different hosts. Oh yeah, yeah. so so a range of IPs. Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh yes, you can do that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, and then in terms of routing, I think I probably said everything was about that. This is the really clever bit. You publish 10.0.0.7, and the profile says, "Ha ha! If you want to go to 10.0.0.7, I know what to do with it. Send it to the edge, and we'll take care of it." and get it to the connector for you, right? So that, that's that piece there. Uh, coming soon, UDP, a private DNS, which we talked about briefly. Let's just do a, a quick demo on this. Um, and, um, oh, um, oh, yes, that's only, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I've forgotten, I hadn't got a recording. Um, I was just gonna do, so let's go to my NAS client. Um, we've already seen SMB. So I've got the, the uh, we can go into SMB, and, but what I've got here is I've got an RDP connection. So I'm going to go RDP and connect with RDP, and it's prompting me to authenticate. So we'll go in as James Bond, and then it's asking me. So it's RDP connection, which is now asking for MFA. But I can, because it's published through, um, as an enterprise application, I can control exactly who can access it. And because it's an enterprise application, I can apply whatever uh, conditional access policies I want to it. Okay, 
So it was uh, just a very quick demo of that. The last thing that's included in SSE, um, let me, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bother to log in. Um, the last thing is universal tenant restrictions. Now, uh, tenant restrictions, actually, there are three flavors of them. Um, the first flavor, the, the, the whole idea of a um, tenant restrictions is so that somebody working on one of your machines in your organization, they're a consultant from another org. It's, you, you know, you, the problem is you can't stop them easily signing in with a Microsoft account or another tenant's account. The reason being, of course, your guys need to get at their MSA accounts. Your guys need to get at the, um, you know, the intra ID logins, right? So you can't block those. You could block it if it was to Google or somewhere else, but you can't block it to the Microsoft accounts and you can't block it to the intra accounts. So this idea of tenant restrictions came in, which uh, the initial V1 used tagging, right? So when the logon server received this, it's a ha ha, I can read this tag and no, I'm not gonna sign you in, right? Um, that was okay, uh, it worked, but it was a sort of, you know, uh, one size fits all. So basically everyone went through this because it had to be down on the network appliance. So you had to get your network administrator involved and so on. Um, it also doesn't prevent from token injection. So if I came in and I, from home, I'd signed in and I had a token to my tenant, I could bring that token in and replay it and I would have access to my tenant from your real estate, okay? Um, and also it didn't block anonymous access. So if you get, you, so, so if you go to anonymous access to SharePoint and something like that. Again, remote clients needed to be hairpinned because they needed to go out through that network appliance. And then um, T2 came in. With T2, uh, you had the restrictions actually in the portal, which was very nice. And then uh, they implemented T2 by basically do doing the tagging in the app and the browser. Um, the only browser that really did it was Edge. Right, so really, you know, oh, well, I'm, damn it, I can't log into my corporate network. What I'll do is I'll use Chrome. Um, so that didn't work terribly successfully unless you're in total control of the client machines and you could lock them down. But uh, universal tenant restrictions does the injection at the edge, right? So no longer does the network administrator have to get involved. You got all the benefits of the tenant restrictions V2, uh, and it works for all GSA clients. It also works for branch office. And, and just to, to, to very quickly show you that, because I've got this little demo here, which I'll finish off on, and I'm just going to go here. I'll just close that off. Okay, that, and what we'll do is we'll use Chrome, just to show it works with Chrome, and we'll go to uh, portal.azure.com, uh, and I will sign in as um, from, so th this is my dev tenant, I'm signing in with a, uh, from a different tenant. Next on there, worker school account, um, Good question, actually. Uh, <laughs> I never use them anymore. I <laughs> uh, think that's right. Oh, there you go, access blocked. Okay, so that's tenant restrictions coming in to, to block it. And, and uh, you, you can, but the nice thing is very fine grained control. You can say who can sign in to their, their home tenant and for what applications they can sign in. And that, and I um, brings us to the very end of the slide deck. And did I answer the question, can we get rid of a VPN? That is your decision. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm, I'm quite happy to carry on answering questions, but Jack, you winded up. No, with thank us. you very much, John. That was, that was awesome. Um, we had, actually have had a question from uh, online, somebody from YouTube has asked, 
do all of those logs get um, that you were showing those those like traffic logs? Can you export them to a log analytics workspace? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, so and, you, and you have to because they only have a finite lifetime, fine. which I assume is thirty days. I've I've never. And is yeah. that just via like the enter activity logs that you just set yeah, up? Yeah, it's same just exactly the same. You export them, and then you can run the playbooks against them. Yeah. And and do all the other good stuff. And and also the the M three sixty five advanced logging. Again, you'd want to take into log analytics workspace so you can analyze it appropriately. Perfect. So and, and if sense. anyone's not familiar with it, the, the the logs basically disappear after thirty days, and what you need to do is pull them out into another space, which is very easy. No, uh, that's awesome. Hope that has answered that question remotely perfectly. Uh, any other questions in the room before we uh, wrap it up this evening? <laughs> Go for it. Okay, so okay, so I am absolutely not allowed to talk about licensing on this. Are Neither you? am I. Nope. <laughs> no, nope. and I don't know. It's not the part of the business okay. I work if, in. So. If, if you have an NDA, I can give you a contact detail who you can email in Microsoft, and they will give you a little document which just uh, describes the licensing. So, so the so, question was pricing and licensing, and uh, TBD is... Probably the answer. Well, it's TBD, but you can, you can. They will disclose it if you have an NDA, but they're not giving it out to anyone unless you've got an NDA with them. So it's about the second. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going, I'm So at the second, any traffic that you're sending through the SWG is isn't costed. And you mean during the preview? Yes. No. No. Oh, okay. So all, all bandwidth, unlike you know VNet peering or like egress. Yeah. No. No. Not the moment. But there's no licensing involved either at the moment. Cool. Yeah. So I suppose the licensing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Makes sense. Preview. Yeah. Um, but it was just on that traffic front. So obviously CPUs. Yeah. I, I. I can't. I. It, yeah. It's say if you've got an NTA, I can give you a contact in Microsoft to, uh, to email. Yeah. That's going to be the question then: whether you switch it or not from a VPN. Yes. So and that. And that. That's why they're prepared to give you some advance clues, <laughs> but um, yeah. Uh, for me, it looks like this product can replace even the Microsoft products like, you know, uh, point, to site, uh, point to site VPN, yeah. you know, so if I want to connect to any of my private um, uh, resources, currently I use point to site VPN, even it can, it, it looks like it can replace Bastion as well, like if I want to connect, you know, uh, this thing. So is it all my understanding right? Like Gscaler, Bastion, and, you know, point to set uh, VPN, all these are all, you know, um, can be replaced with one one product. Is it is it the understanding? Yeah, no, you've actually got that, that spot on. Like you could replace all of your current VPN solutions or jump box solutions like uh, Bastion or point side VPNs via VWAN or via just normal virtual network gateways with this. I think it will be a decision for lots of organizations because this very much sits in the intra and identity people space and the network team have probably never looked at this and now they'll be like, oh, that's, that's shiny, I'll, I'll have a play with that. And that's where they would normally play in something like point site or VPN. So I think there'll be some organizational politics at play um, to make this come together because, you know, enter admins giving network people admin access to their part of the portal that they own will take time, even though it'll be hidden behind different roles, I'm sure, right, SSE, like there'll be different RBAC roles for configuring SSE inside of Entra. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are there are RBAC roles already for, for yeah, configuring it. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's going to be interesting as to where it fits now in the organization. Because, you know, network was very specialist in terms of, especially when there are appliances involved and so on. Um, and now this brings it, I don't know, do you call it more mainstream? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. We, they're all coming to, together as one. But networking is still important. Everybody has to understand networking. Um, learn networking, you'll never be out of a job, um, is my advice. So, yeah, but I think you'll see both side by side for a long time, I think, is the answer. I don't think you'll see it replace Bastion because devs won't want to play. They'll we want to do it from some weird machines that have never seen the light of Entra. Um, so yeah, they'll still want raw RDP or SSH access, but slowly over time, I think as people push forward into zero trust and that comes in, you'll see this just be the de facto standard. 
Any others? No? So, um, we're going to look sorry about this. <laughs> on, um, so on, you know, it's not just us that does like conditional access style rules. Obviously, it's, it's applications that we're consuming as well, um, and some of which are a legacy. And they'll say, "Oh, you can access our service if you're coming from a specific IP," or they'll allow you to do some sort of like, um, uh, like get out of jail free card things, or yeah, you know, if, if you're experiencing a problem, you say, "Oh, okay." We'll put you in our, um, you know, our whitelist. A good example is like banking services. So if you want to access a banking services, they will sometimes say, "Oh, you need to come from a specific IP address." So I know with a lot of vendors, you'll that you can request from like the Secure Web Gateway or from the firewall as a service a specific IP address. Do you know if that's been something that's been spoken about as well, or is that something that's in there today? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the current situation is on that, but um, I mean. You can rest assured that pretty much everything you can think about it's with regard much. to this is being discussed. Um, I mean, it, it's it's a matter of I, you know, it's a matter of prioritizing work. So, you know, and and I guess feedback from customers as to what the the, the next route should be. But, I mean, it's a complicated decision that they have to make, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's any other questions for John before we, before we close? No, um, you obviously um, can ask away, join the WhatsApp group, um, ask away many questions as you like. Um, but yeah, thanks again, John. Amazing session. Uh, lots of interesting uh, discussions, I think. And yeah, one that I think we're all going to go away and start playing with and trying to try to abuse. So yeah, thanks again. Another round of applause for John. <laughs> All right, and uh, with that, I think, um, thanks for coming. Feel free to grab another drink uh, and any remaining pizza so I don't have to put it in the bin. Um, and, yeah, we will see you all at the next one, uh, 14th of May, um, with uh, Microsoft AI, with uh, Brighton AI as a collaborative user group event. So, yeah, it should be a good one. should be a, a good, good few hundred people, so please come on along and get signed up early. So, yeah, yeah be two people. I'll keep saying it's going to be 100 <laughs> We've got a big venue. Yeah. Please come and fill it. <laughs> um, awesome. Thank you very much. Well, and, and, yeah. I just got to say thank you very much for all the questions. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah.